All right. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for coming today. Uh, my name is Claudia Pollock. I am the Marketing and Community Coordinator here at Ephemera. Today, we're celebrating on this Friday, we're launching some very special projects. Uh, I'm joined here today with Giselle Flores and Henry Hornstein. And we're going to be talking about Off on Gallery and Show, which will be the first work being featured by Giselle's new gallery here on Ephemera. So at the end, we'll also be revealing the winner of the book giveaway for show, a uh, signed hardcover copy of the photography series. So, okay, let's get started here. Um, all right, so let's do some introductions. Um, I'm very pleased to be speaking with Giselle Flores. She's an artist working with manual camera and video techniques, often focusing on themes of light, energy, and time. A Rhode Island School of Design alumni, Giselle holds 18 plus years of experience in the New York City photography scene, working and assisting in commercial photography. Giselle is now a leader in the crypto art space, having tokenized work as early as 2019 on Super Rare, and co-founded community spaces such as Women of Crypto Art, also known as WOCA. So welcome, Giselle. We're very happy to have you. Hello. So nice to, what an introduction. Yes. <laughs> All right. And we're also joined uh, by Henry here. Henry is a photographer, filmmaker, teacher, and author. His works have been collected and exhibited internationally at institutions like the Smithsonian Museum of American History, the Museum of Fine Arts Houston, the J. Paul Getty Museum, and more. Henry has also published over 30 books in his career, showcasing his bodies of work, such as Show, Honky Tonk, and Shoot What You Love, a memoir and authored educational materials such as black and white photography, beyond basic photography, digital photography, and more. Recently, Henry has been exploring filmmaking with his film partners now available to watch on Amazon Prime and is currently a professor at the Rhode Island School of Design. So welcome, Henry. We're very delighted to have you here today. Thank you. And the, uh, the teacher of Giselle. Which is yes. That, we know each other. Giselle is one of my excellent, most excellent students, and mm -hmm. you've stayed in touch over the years, uh, fortunately. But 18 years, Giselle, wow. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. So that's, that's one thing I really wanted uh, to talk about today, too, was the relationship between you two and how you met. Um, so if we could explore that a little bit. Um, Your version? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Henry was uh, my professor at RISD uh, towards the end of my time at RISD, really, um, when I was uh, doing independent study uh, thesis on photography, large format, you know, mural printing, um, you know, working with all the analog, <laughs> dark room, lovely things we could work with. Um, I was an illustration major, though, and so I did mostly drawing and figure drawing and sculpture and all these other things, too, when I was at RISD. And Henry was like this wonderful liaison to the photo world at the school, and he's been there a very long time, I think, teaching and inspiring so many people like myself, <laughs> of teaching them the one the one thing that sticks with our memories forever when Henry teaches is shoot what you love. Um, so I'm so happy to have Henry here and presenting this awesome event uh, and gallery and you know just opening of this new world for Henry's work and to show his work to a whole new generation of creators and um, kind of giving a really good glimpse of the history of photography and kind of what brought us all to this kind of visual communication that we are in now is kind of our whole universe right now. So um, we have to really look into the past to kind of see what we are going to in the future. So um, Henry, uh, please say your version. Oh, that, that's, that's <laughs> we'll see if they match up. <laughs> <laughs> what I remember, I remember so really well, even, um, although we've stayed in contact, that's of course part of it. But um, she came from a different department and just came in and just jumped right in. And just she does a, everything that way. But but I didn't know her then, you know. So it was a little bit of a surprise, particularly when you were a senior and you know in college and you hadn't been around very much because you weren't a photo major. So um, but uh, you know you jumped in two feet and then you you know but. Our illustration department is a weird one. I, maybe it's true of all illustration department, but people come in there partly to do illustration and partly so they have the freedom to explore other uh, other media. And that's what your perfect example of that, really, and uh, successful, perfect example. 
And, um, but over the years, um, we stayed in touch mostly because I would bring my students to New York once a year. And Giselle was usually a stop along the way because I like to, to bring them to uh, graduates of the school and what they've done. And particularly people who are doing interesting stuff and not uh, just bartending, but actually moving ahead with their art. Nothing against bartenders. I spend a lot of time with them. But, um, you know, a, a lot of people don't keep going with their art. And Giselle, of course, has. And so she's a great visit um, uh, when we go. So that's mainly, I think, how we stayed in touch for so long, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, yeah. So anyway, that's my that's my story. To um, I, I would love to touch up upon that. Um, the, one of the, the last few classes, I think the last three times your classes visited my studio, I started talking to them about yeah. NFTs. Yeah. <laughs> like three, yeah. three yeah. visits ago. <laughs> I know what you were talking about. The first there was time. One guy in the last class who understood. Do you remember that? He yeah. was the only guy in the class. Most of them were nodding off, including me. But um, <laughs> one guy who was like a, a total, you know, techie kind of guy, and he completely, and he kind of asked you a lot of questions. And I thought, well, maybe there's something to it, you know, but I didn't really, it didn't hit me particularly at the time, honestly. Yeah. Took about, yeah, about three years of, of my own exploration in the world, kind of seeing what it, what it, you know, what's in it and what does it mean and, and what is this, can this be? And showing it to these kids was really fun every year, showing a different perspective. And I felt pretty crazy even trying it or even doing it. And it was like, hey, you know, I, I was wondering to see if, what they would know if they knew anything yet. And, and it was so cool towards the last, this last year, they were they were like just starting to hear about it, and uh, it's right. so fun to see that. And then it started, you know. Then recently, you know, the last three months or four months, it's it's been in media and everything. But um, being able to expose kids even before the culture was anything um, seen by anybody outside of this was really cool. Yeah. Um, yeah. So really fun. Um, yeah, that's really interesting, too, because it seems like the roles have almost reversed a little bit, Giselle. Now you're teaching Henry all about NFTs and blockchain and, and this whole world of crypto. Yeah, I love that part of it. Yeah. And I do. And, um, you know, I think as a teacher, I'm I'm, I'm watching that. I just finished it. Um, uh, I can't remember his name. In, Kaminsky's Method. Have you seen that? It's a, a Netflix. I don't know if you get it. I know in Canada there's. Shows are somehow sometimes different, but but it's with Michael Douglas and Alan Arkin. It it's it, I think it's really good, but um, and it's about a teacher, an acting teacher. And I got to say, I relate a lot to, you know, what's in there. He's a better teacher than I am, but <laughs> but, uh, but he had a whole cast of people to help him out too. Uh, but anyway, so I think about that a lot. And teaching is a very rich thing for a lot of reasons. I think. And um, so I've been doing it for a while, as uh, Giselle said. And Giselle referred to the history of photography. Uh, and I've definitely lived through a lot of it, but not so much uh, the old history, which is 200 years old and not that old. But um, the what's happened during the time that I've been in it is photography was, was a thing. You know, it was a career. It was a job. It was a, it still is for a lot of people. But. Uh, you worked for a newspaper or you worked for industry or you worked in a fashion studio or something. And um, in fact, last night I went to the Boston Press Photographers Association annual do, you know, and because uh, I have a lot of friends who are newspaper photographers and, and um, you know, and I and it was a slim group of people, there, you know, because there are many newspaper photographers left. The career is kind of gone. But some of that stuff has morphed into um, into art, <laughs> into the art. You know, one minute they were photojournalists and the next minute they were artists, right? It's a big jump um, or a different jump, let's say. And um, I met a guy who I knew a little bit, but I knew his work very well, Stan Grousefeld, who works for the Boston Globe. And he he won a Pulitzer Prize in, I forget what year, but you know, two decades ago. 
And he beat out uh, Sebastian Salgado, who was one of the great photojournalists of all time. And there he is. Amazing. Uh, one of the bullets are over Salgado, which is really, you know, so uh, it's, the world's changed a lot, really quickly uh, in a lot of ways. But for photographers, when you started, just how even, you know, 18 years ago, or whatever it was, it was a different thing. If you went back to RISD now as a student, I think you'd find the whole sensibility and, you know, what pe what the students really want. It's quite, um, quite changed. It's, it's so interesting. Uh, you know, at the time I left RISD, it was every, the professional photographers were just starting to access digital photography. Um, when I started uh, professionally, you know, assisting, um, I, I was working at a, at a digital capture company where they bring these big computers and servers and everything to a photo studio so that a photographer could, instead of using film, use computers for their photography. Um, so I was helping them uh, set that up. I was, I was like transitioning photographers into digital photography. Right. So it, it's amazing to now be in another state, uh, another point of transition with um, now into blockchain, um, seeing, you know, provenance and, and uh, the, the, the sovereignty of, of artists now kind of coming to be with this possibilities um, are, are really amazing. So that's something that I'm very passionate about and um, hoping to move forward with this gallery and everything we do with it. Um, one thing I noticed with the NFTs is like everybody is excited about the tech aspects of like what kind of utility can you bring to these non-fungible tokens and what you know but there's also just a, a state of of the historical context of these items that are now encapsulating not only a digital file but sometimes multiple digital files or like a you know it's almost like a capsule now of an artwork that we can embed with different things like tokens or different um images or pieces of the story so that's something i'm i'm trying to instill into the off on gallery you know off chain artists now on chain um trying to bring this meld of of tech but also kind of like in a very simple minimal way of like telling the story more than anything um telling the story of these creators and and what they've been giving to the world um for many years so that's that's kind of where where I'm headed. Well, you have so many different layers that we didn't have originally. You know, we, before we had a photograph and threw it on the wall, or <laughs> it was in a book or a magazine, whatever. And then the internet came along, and um, computers and digital capture and so forth and so on. And you're right, you were right at the intersection of all of that. Like and even 2004, 2005, yeah, was when the first real digital cameras. You know, not real, but you know, very, very uh, practical uh, to just bring this to So 2004 is about more or less your your, your era uh, as a young photographer. But but the other thing, and why I got interested in uh, NFTs, I'm not doing this to promote NFTs per se, <laughs> yeah. but just to say how why I got interested. In, first of all, you're very convincing personally, of course, and that's a big part of it. But also I think it is in, you know, the COVID and the pandemic and so forth moves it forward. But, but um, we had a whole gallery system for photographs, uh, traditional galleries uh, for photography that kind of followed the art model, you know, the painting and the sculpture and all of that, and, uh, and just dragged along. But um, that was starting to fall, I think, it was starting to fall apart a little bit even before the pandemic. And um, in the pandemic, I wouldn't say killed it, but it was definitely live. Uh, but for example, I was talking to my gallery in New York um, a couple of weeks ago, and I said, you know, how are you doing? You're surviving, you know, because a lot of places have closed up. And he said, I'm doing really well, believe it or not. He said, but there's a huge difference. And the difference is that 90% of my sales are online where nobody buys off the wall anymore. I mean, maybe that will change, you know, with the pandemic ending, but people will feel comfortable doing that. And sometimes it's, you know, five figures they're paying for it for a print online and they're just 
trust, not just, but their trust in condition and things like that, that the gallery is, you know, honest and, and so forth uh, and accurate about it. And so I think it's possible, um, I think it's very possible that uh, we'll morph from the gallery, the traditional gallery, which probably will still exist, but will become less a part of it than some kind of a digital platform. And whether it's NFTs or whether there's something else down the road, I have no idea. But, you know, NFTs are here. They're lively. It's a lively going thing. So, uh, and, and Jatel's there. So why not give it a shot? I mean, that's how I, honestly, how I look. Yeah, it, it's interesting that you mention the online sales because I don't think I've ever seen a point in time until like this past six months even that I, I find these traditional like art spaces and galleries. And I mean, I used to work as a framer at a framing shop and and now I, I see them moving towards uh, like an e-store, an online e-store to sell the work of their artists online when that was something they never did before. And so we're seeing like a lot of, you know, from small town galleries and like and framing shops moving towards online sales for their artists and not not just NFTs. And then we see, you know, um, auction houses like Sotheby's also moving towards NFTs. But we're seeing a lot of this digital entrance, which is really interesting. Yeah, I think so too. And I think also, I mean, I know that there has been this burgeoning um, uh, move, again, not an exclusive move, but a part of it, one of the little sectors of, of what we do um, towards uh, people buying low cost, uh, low cost prints that are unsigned, but are the original image, either from the artist or from a gallery or a nonprofit raising money and they're sometimes selling hundreds of of these pictures for not not a lot per unit, but when you add it all up, it's real money. And um, and it it's uh, democratizing the process. You no longer have to go in and buy tens of thousand dollars worth of worth of art, but you love a photograph or you love an image for a couple hundred bucks, you can have it on the wall and a nice nice version of it too. What, what I love about um, what NFTs kind of bring to that, um, because there is a similar thing that can be done with NFTs with additions and all that, right. um, is you, you, the name. The name. The name always sticks to it. Like if you had get a print from anywhere, it's like you, if it's not signed, you, there's no way to really keep that memory of who that name is. Um, and there's something really great about NFTs, the way they do that. And they should really always keep the author um, in the forefront of the, of the actual image, you know? So I like that. And I, um, I think that's a, a huge reason of, the, of why it's great for the future. <laughs> um, as more creators create and everybody um, becomes that, it seems like everybody's headed to be a creator. Seems like it, doesn't it? <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> we all communicate now visually through all these different means. <laughs> yeah, a lot of us, and so there's room for different ways of expressing yourself or doing the business of it or whatever it is, you know, there's room for a lot of ways to look at it. And whatever works, works, you know, or, or doesn't is the way I look at it. Should we take a look at uh, the show? Yeah. I'm going yes, to go stream the book for a while to have something for people to look at. Let's do that. <coughs> this is the one I did last. Oh, wait. One more try. There we go. Beautiful. This is the book we are giving away, Henry's show. We'll just be scrolling back and forth the pages as we talk. Um, we have three new Genesis mints of Henry's from this edition of show on the website of Ephemera and on, off on gallery.
So Athlon Gallery, for those who are tuning in, um, is a gallery that's built directly into Ephemera. So galleries allow for the opportunity uh, for a curator or an arts professional to mint work on behalf of the artist, kind of bridging like a gap between the fine art world, um, those artists that may not be native to crypto and kind of helping them over that hiccup into getting involved in the crypto space. Uh, so Off on Gallery is run by Giselle here and this is the first uh, launch for Off on Gallery is Henry's work show. And um, it's a really beautiful work. It's stunning black and white images. Um, I'm really in love with it. Henry, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about show. Yeah, yeah absolutely. You know, uh, I was thinking about uh, Giselle back in your day when you were RISD. A lot of uh, students, and I think most photographers, that start out by just taking pictures of random things that interest them, you know, whether it's family or dogs or cats or or any landscape, anything. Mine was meat. Uh, meat? I mean, Mine was oh, meat. Oh my God, I forgot. <laughs> Giant I thought, mural prints of meat. Definitely not a vegetarian. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I remember that. Um, but, um, you know, if you get serious, <laughs> I don't know what that means in a sense, but if you get more involved or engaged in photography, <laughs> let's say, uh, oftentimes you start moving towards projects and working on projects. And that's what I've done a lot, you know, after, you know, I got started myself. And um, in 2000, well, about the time Giselle was graduating, not to keep going back to that, about, about 2001, 2002, 2003, around there, I started photographing friends of mine who did drag, you know, performed at drag shows. And um, then one day I was in, just, I started photographing for them and then for me because I liked the pictures I was getting. Uh, I always think that an interesting subject is like 80% of a good picture. So if I can hook a, a great subject, then, you know, maybe I have a shot. And um, so, and then I was in New Orleans working on it, ending up this project I was doing called Aquatics about um, uh, marine animals. And uh, the aquarium where I was shooting was closed. And I'm looking through the paper for something to do with New Orleans you know, at night, and so I think there's something going on, and I see in the Shim Sham Club in the French Quarter, there's a something called, um, it was the first annual, um, first annual festival called uh, Teaserama. There was kind of a celebration of burlesque, because burlesque was a, you know, an older, then dead, virtually dead, uh, entertainment form from the 20s and 30s and 40s, and, and it died for a variety of reasons. And um, so there was a, this group of uh, all women, virtually, every once in a while there'd be a guy show up, but uh, it was almost all women who were celebrating these great performers who had kind of been up. And some of them were still alive and signing books and pictures and, you know, giving seminars and this and that. And then the younger performers were doing their entertaining and um, and I got in and I photographed informally at my camera and, and took some pictures that I liked and then, you know, realized that this world was starting and I started photographing more and more and eventually built into this. I think 2009 was when I stopped shooting. I can't remember exactly. These Some of these are friends of mine. This woman here, uh, I think we passed her, but, but uh, the pregnant woman, um, uh, Jess, uh, had dinner with her and her husband last week, you know, so some people I've, I've kept, uh, uh, contact with Melody Sweets, another of the, uh, models I'm going out to photograph her in Las Vegas, uh, next week. I'm starting a series. I'm thinking, I'm not sure, but I'm going to call it show girls and show boys. So her friend, she's been working in Vegas and she's going to hook me up. So, um, <laughs> I love that, Henry. You never stop working. <laughs> you never stop shooting. Okay, what is that? Come on. Just... <laughs> <laughs> or as my sister keeps saying, working. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> but it's true. You know, I it love is. to get it. Um, so anyway, um, so that's what this book, to me, you know, the art world, as photography has become more accepted in the art world, it's also on some level, I think, and I'm sure I'll get people disagree with me, but it's also become more 
uh, more proud of itself, not in a good way, more pretentious, <laughs> more, you know, not all of it, but a lot. And, um, you know, and has stopped being, you know, when I started out, it was Bohemia. <laughs> And then at a certain point when it the, when art in America discovered it, it was bye bye Bohemia. You know, it was money was involved and um, egos, always egos, but still even more so. You had to dress a certain way. You know, I mean, really, it was like you know. So um, and that part I really didn't like. But these are art to me are artists. You know, you could call them performance artists because they perform, and some relate to that. Some are uh, art students or artists, graduating artists, and that's how they see themselves. And some see themselves as entertainers, you know, and performers in that in that way. But the thing about them is they got no money. <laughs> they're making this shit up. Sorry, was I supposed to say that? They're making it up. You know, they're like they're uh, doing their own clothes. They're doing their own routines. They're writing their own jokes. They're singing their own songs and. It's all about them. And that is the very definition of an artist, personal expression. And so to me, these are, you know, amazing artists, you know, regardless of the money, the, you know, where they're working or this or that or the other thing. But, but they're amazing artists. And some keep continue doing it and some, you know, don't anymore. It's just the way that goes. But if you think of musicians or other kinds of artists, it's the same thing, kind of, really. And, um, you know, so that's that's what I do. I love the pictures, you know. I, I love the people that I know. A lot of them I'd still in touch with, not all of them. Um, Melody, who's out in Las Vegas, is a real is a big success story because a lot of the people come into this with the idea that they're going to be on Broadway, you know, down the road or something like that, you know. Mm -hmm. That they're going to have a career in, you know, in music. How many people really have a career in music? It's a small percentage, but some do occasionally. And uh, Melody is working regular in Vegas, you know, and she's extremely talented singer. She looks great and all of that with her burlesque, but she's also an incredible singer. And uh, so sometimes they make it, you know, tough, but sometimes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think my favorite part of this body of work is how private it feels to me. Like I'm getting this behind the scene glimpse of the glamour and performative aspect of, you know, burlesque of striptease. And, you know, when you go to a performance, it's it's very controlled, it's rehearsed over and over again. But with this series, I feel like it's a very genuine look into the human aspect. You know, you keep mentioning like artist and that's exactly what it is. It's like, I feel like we're just seeing a more genuine look at the people behind these performances and not just these characters, you know, that have been manufactured for us in a way. This is well, like the, the beginning of the DIY. The beginning of? DIY, yeah, yeah. DIY, do it yourself, like. Yeah, in a way, yeah, you could yeah. say that. But you know, a lot of my work over the years, and I didn't even think of it that way, this way until someone pointed it out, or someone else say it to me. Um, but is about community. And this is a community of artists, you know, um, who are offbeat, you know, they're not like your standard uh, uh, regulation artists, but I did, a, uh, with a couple of friends, I did a film, you mentioned Claudia that I'm doing films, and uh, the first one I did, which shows that it was the first one, but still has wonderful moments, is about one of the stars of this world, Murray Hill, who's a drag king, and a, I think he's the presenter now for um, uh, Dita Von Teese, who's a great star of this world. And, you know, he t uh, Murray tells the jokes and while well, Dita's doing her change in the back and, and uh, does that. And, and, but at any rate, we made a film about Murray and, had, and I showed the, a little clip of the film sometimes in class because his message is so good to me. He says, I'm trying to remember, I guess I asked him why he did burlesque or why he did what he's doing, you know? And he said, he said, you know, when I came to New York, um, everyone was a little weird and it was dangerous and it was like, you know, uh, and so forth and so on. And, um, 
and open and now it's not that way so much in New York. He said, but I'm trying to um, I'm trying to bring some of that back and what I do. And also when I came, I was like a weirdo and I came and I was lost and I didn't know anyone. And I found this community of artists who were doing burlesque. They were my people, you know, I didn't say it that way, but that's really what you're saying. And, uh, and I wanted to find a place in that world and also establish a world for others that were coming in at the same time. And that's why I do it. He said, I asked why he did it, I guess. And, um, and so a lot of what I do is about that, about a community of sorts. And as fun as it'll be to go to Las Vegas, if that happens, and I think it will, um, it's also to look at this community. Who are the showgirls and showboys at Las Vegas? They must be a family of sorts. You know, good friends, lovers, fighters, competitors, you know, everything <laughs> the family has. Um, and that's kind of how I see a lot, most of my work, not all of it, most of it. Mm -hmm. And I love how you touched on community. I mean, when I was studying photography at Ryerson, um, one thing that we talked a lot about amongst our professors and our, the students was how do we as photographers enter a community that we're not necessarily a part of? You know, how do we do that respectfully and, and photograph in a way that is doesn't make anyone feel uncomfortable, you know, in, in a way that is respectful. So I'm wondering like how you navigated that during this, this process. Well, um, in different ways, I guess you could say mm -hmm. kind of, it's, it, I think my background doing photojournalism, I wasn't a very successful photojournalist, but I started there. And so I kind of learned a lot about that world um, and how to, how to work, but I was, um, I struggled through it, the same thing you're saying, you know, and how do you, but I, I discovered fairly early on, in fact, I'm, I'm doing a book um, in the fall uh, called Speedway 72. It, it pictures I made 50 years ago at the Thompson Speedway, stock car racing. And, and that's when I learned what you asked, because uh, my brother-in-law used to race stock cars. And he got me a job as a um, photographer for one summer for the Speedway. And um, I had a little badge. <laughs> I still have it. It's the publisher of the book, you know, that said it press and so forth and so on. And I just shot anyone I wanted. And just if anyone asked, I just said, looking for the program, you know, the, the track program. And they're okay, you know. And so if you have a reason to be there that's very understandable, you don't need to. All the questions of you know respect and connection and all of that go out the window you can have that stuff but um but you don't need it because you have a reason reason to be there but some people are very sensitive about you know and some people just aren't and uh my favorite story about that was a great photographer elliot Irwin told this story um he made a picture most of you are familiar with it all of you i'm sure whether you know it or not, Jackie Kennedy, when she was at the funeral of her, um, of her, her husband, the president, um, she's in a black veil and looking very sad and so forth. That was a picture Elliot Irwin made uh, during the funeral. And it's, you know, it's a um, an iconic picture of that time. And I, uh, someone said, I wasn't talking about it, but, but someone did, was asked the question, is that how, you know, how'd you do that? Same question you're asking, Claudia. He said, oh, he said, I used a long lens and stayed in the way. I didn't want to disrespect her or get in, you know. And um, and they said, oh, is that your your suggestion? He said, no, no. He said, you should be who you are. He said, I that's the way I am. I'm a little shy, and i got to find a way to make my personality match what, you know, what my goals are. He said, um, I'm like Luke was quoting here. And he said, but I won't mention the photographer's name, but a very famous portrait photographer in the same era, did a lot of work for Life magazine and you know, big magazines at the time. And he said, you know, if he was photographing the funeral, he would have jumped on the casket and gone down with it. <laughs> you know, and it, and it was it is, was because I go around and work with. But um 
So I thought that was good because you've got to figure out who you are and find a way to make that work. If you're a respectful person, um, you know, you'll make it work. Another successful student of mine was a guy named Jim Goldberg. The photographers might know who he was. He did a book called Raised with Wolves and we called Rich and Poor. Both are big books in uh, in their eras, in photography in any era. And um, when I, he was a student of mine way, way back. And uh, I ran into him at one point. He was starting Raised with Wolves, which is about feral kids in Los Angeles, kids who are basically homeless and, uh, you know, and hustling to stay alive. And um, I said, how's that going and everything? He said, oh, it's great. I've been at it for a year. I said, are you getting great pictures? And he said, oh, I'm not taking any pictures. He said, I'm just getting to know them and having them know me. And he said, I don't want to exploit them, you know, and everything. I said, Jim, I think you should be taking pictures. You know, I'd like to, this seems to be, you know. And he said, no, no. And he made this beautiful. You know, it was who he was, not who I was. And it's a good thing for a teacher to understand, I think, that your students don't have to be you, they have to be them, and you've got to help them do that. That is a great point. Mm -hmm. I think many people who have gone to higher learning have found certain teachers that really don't jive with them. <laughs> <As in life. laughs> yeah, as everybody does, I'm sure. Um, yeah. But yeah, you always have to keep that in mind. It's like no it's so important that it's uh you know it's not my life that i'm you know it's their life <laughs> you know and they they should take what i i tell them this all the time i don't know if i did back in the day but but i i'm so conscious of it now you know because i've seen it a lot too but you know you go to a place like RISD, you've got 15 or 20 really good teachers mostly really good teachers or even if they're not really good teachers people with something to say and you listen and try to pull one or two things out from each one and you've got something at the end of it you know you got a lot but you've got to make that you got to pull the stuff out that works for you and not for somebody else and anyone who's successful with it has done that i mean you've made a, a, an incredible career giselle i mean you know you, i was gonna say that that's like kind of good. <laughs> You did. Not that, but it's it's uh, just taking little bits. You know, take what use what what works for you. That's a great great way to say it. Because really, you don't have to read the whole book. It's just like <laughs> it's just like keep the little excerpt that really means something to you. Um, yeah, if you just get a little nugget from someone, even if you didn't like the teacher, you know what I mean. Even generally, if you didn't like the teacher, didn't buy their you know approach, but they're probably teaching for a reason. You know, they're probably yeah. there because they know some stuff or they've had experiences and, you know, can teach you. Um, so, and I think it's a big mistake. A lot of students did it. I did it when I was a student a lot. If I didn't like a teacher, I would dismiss them. <laughs> it would be money to go to that, you know, <laughs> listen. <laughs> Maybe they'll speak to you a little bit, you know. Yeah, uh, let's switch gears here a little bit. So I wanna talk about the decision behind the three Genesis pieces that you've decided to tokenize. So we have you know, this huge body of work here. So I wanna hear a little bit about the choice behind the selection there. Well, that was, might speak to that better than I. That was, yeah. that was it. Sorry? No, the, yeah, that, that um, it, was, it was a hard decision, Henry's like. And he's like, you choose. <laughs> I'm like, oh so no. Can we, can we share your screen there? I am trying to share a screen. Oh. Let's see if it works. Here, let me try one more time. Okay. Let's see if this will work. Uh, I was gonna go to the Afon gallery and just look at them there. Is it sharing? Yes. Oh, great, cool. Okay, so here we are. Ah. So these are the three mints of the Genesis drop. Um, I, you know, it's, I, I, I lived with all of them for a while. <laughs> I lived with them and I kept, you know, trying to see what three, and um, not only what three, but which three stories um, that I thought worked really well together in, for the beginning. Um, and wh when I say stories, I mean, um, within, these, within these tokens, 
we have um, the image, of course, but also in the description here, uh, each one has a personal story of Henry's uh, when he shot the image. Um, and if you look here on the vision board, we have uh, a handwritten memo of, of, uh, of the experience of what Henry, you know, something, something fun that he wanted to include about, about his story. Uh, that's one thing with uh, having, um, having these images tokenized is really fun because you can put more than just the image. Um, I love this vision board option because it, it just gives us a bigger picture of what, uh, of what this experience was about. And, and Henry as a teacher, you know, he's been telling his stories over and over to these students. And, and you, I'm, I'm sure as you hear him speak, you, it's like he gets ideas and, and stories from every part uh, around him. Um, and when he's talking of his photography, he usually has all these really fun snippets of his experience that get lost if, you don't, if you're not there with him. Uh, hearing about his stories and and how he documented. So I wanted to kind of try to use these NFTs in that way to kind of instill a little more into the NFT than just the picture. Like I would love to put the whole experience. I wish I could grab Henry's like video and like face yeah. and just like stick them in there. But like of the actual experience that he went through, you know, like, I don't know. So this is my, this is the the take that we did for this. And these pictures are just, I mean, any so any any dark room photographer, anybody who appreciates the silver prints or like, you know, these gelatin uh, of of the past, so like the quality of the film grain and the and the analog uh, things to a lot of these pictures is just, I love it and it's fun to see and it's cool to have it in an NFT. I think. But, um, so here we are. This well, is there were film pictures, you're right, Giselle. Um, but I was just noticing, I'm uh, rereading re my uh, my uh, description. Uh, and I say this one was 2005, which is when I started, 2003, four, when I started this project. And um, that was, digital cameras came in about that time, as I said. And, um, but I wasn't using it, I was using film. It took me a while to be converted. and. Uh, but towards the end of the project, I was shooting both film and did. So, you know, there are a few pictures at the end that were uh, digitally uh, captured, but, but uh, that was a transition for me in terms of technology. I love, I still have a dark room, it's crazy. Um, but uh, I love that and still, but, you know, for practical purposes and a lot of other reasons, uh, um, digital, you know, really rules. So. Yeah. Digital, you, you know, it's it's native to everybody now, digital. <laughs> it's I mean, it's, it's like, like... The occasional project, you know, film yeah. and uh, dark room makes sense. And when I do prints of older work, I do uh, uh, silver prints. But if it's more modern work, I do digital prints. And honestly, you could say that the digital prints are better, but they're not, they're better, but they're not as good. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. <laughs> I'm going to write that down. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Bring that up and you could have it. <laughs> but seriously, it's kind of the way, um... <laughs> I did a book called Honky Tonk, pictures I made in the 70s about country musicians and everything. And somebody once asked me, um, if I could, you know, if I did it again, would I do a better job? Or maybe they were insulting me. I don't know. Anyway, so <laughs> if I would do a better job or not? And I thought, and I thought, you know, I I probably would do a better job, but I don't know if it would be as heartfelt. Because when I did it, it was like, oh, you know, I thought about it, dreamed about, it, and and now I'd knock it off, you know, and probably do a good job, hopefully, but. Um, I wouldn't be as engaged. It should, be, should I uh, delete that? <laughs> <laughs> here's the here's the flame. Here's the flambeau. Flambeau. Um, anything you can tell us about that one, or would you like to read the story behind it? Well, I'll tell you quickly. It's hysterical because. Uh, this was a shoot that my friend Bonnie Dunn, who unfortunately passed away just before 
the pandemic, but um, she was a performer and um, she also a producer. She had a show that she produced in, uh, well, she had different locations, but uh, in New York. And um, anyway, so she would get me models from time to time. I'd rent a studio and we'd shoot. And we got uh, Flambeau, um, this guy's great. And he came in and the studio wasn't that high. Like a lot of studios are really high ceilings, but this one was not particularly high. And he starts setting up his stuff, you know, and I'm thinking, oh, yeah. and I'm like, <laughs> to this place on fire, you know. And um, and I said something and he said, oh, don't worry about it, do this all the time. Okay. So then he goes and gets a ladder and he gets on a ladder and he uh, encapsulates the sprinklers with aluminum foil so they won't go off with the heat. Which means not only will it burn down, but it'll really burn down because it'll never, there'll never be any sprinkler uh, alarm. So um, I was terrified. <laughs> <laughs> I really thought, and so I worked very quickly, and we did, you know, get that picture, which I really like. I think it's one of the best pictures in the, of the lot. Which is funny because you know burlesque, striptease. You think it was the sexy pictures that, you know, but some of those are good too. I think, or I like. But also, I like the these other things because they were performers. A mm -hmm. lot of sideshow kinds of stuff, circus acts, and things like that. I'm, all, I'm always drawn to fire, so that's <laughs> why I chose it. <laughs> well, to me, I read it as kind of like the intensity and like the passion behind the subculture. Like it's, mm -hmm. I, I love like my favorite part is like the little details that I see, especially like with the fire. It's like it's all part of of the light, you know. I like that. I hadn't thought of. Mm -hmm. Like that. Yeah. Let's see. <clears throat> Let's go to ah uh, to Prince the Prince. Oh, this one's great. Well, this is another setup. A friend of mine who was a um, a wig artist. She creates wigs and uh, so forth, uh, and in this world, but other worlds as well. And uh she got me poppy coffees and he his job at the time was he would go to parties and you know dress with different of her wigs and uh and just walk through the crowd he didn't really do much but walk through the crowd showing off the wig and then he would get another wig and put it on and do the same thing and so but he went on and has had a career he was in um on the show america's got talent and he was one of the finalists on that show and he does on YouTube, there's a great uh, duet with Donna Summer uh, that he sings. And, you know, I'm not sure what he's doing now, but he's got an active website. I, guess I could look and find out. But um, great guy. And when he, uh, he was going up for America's Got the Finals, I sent him an email and said, um, uh, you know, good luck. I said, it good. and so forth. And he wrote back and he said, I'm just going to ride this pony till it drops. <laughs> <laughs> My computer's ready. Oh. <laughs> okay. Anyway, uh, <laughs> Prince, he was great. And um, very, this actually was a digitally taken picture, um, Giselle. Okay. I converted it to black and white and and actually you know here we have giselle my students teaching me as uh body says teaching me about this whole world the designer of this book also a student of mine um carrie hunt who giselle knows uh did you work with carrie a little bit or something? my my first internship i think she helped me find it or something uh, okay. i think it was something like that yeah. And anyway, she's a designer now, and she's she's done a couple of books. I've done a couple of books for her, which is great. And um, and but uh, here's another way with show actually it happened. I also photographed in color, even with color film uh, before digital. And I was shooting color, I was shooting black and white. In those days, you, it's terrible. You have to shoot double like that. And then, and then um, I was not sure if I should do it in color or black and white, you know? And I was going back and forth, back and forth. And I, I showed the work to my students, which I do uh, a fair amount. If I, and I want their feedback is why I do it. And uh, 
And this uh, woman in the class raises her hand and says, ah, black and white. And I said, you know, she was determined. She was like, and I said, oh, okay. I said, you know why? And she said, the color is so predictable. And the black and white is different. And I thought that was really great advice. And that's actually why I ended up doing it. She told me to. And don't I, Giselle? That's so nice. Yes. <laughs> One of the rare humans. <laughs> I just don't have any of my own ideas, so I have to grab it from you. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, my God. No, I, I agree that black and white is, I mean, everything I've known of yours was black and white from what I know. Um, yeah, I've done a couple of uh, color projects. In fact, I'm working on one now that I'm uh, fighting the same battle in my head, color of black and white, because <laughs> I really do like the color a lot. But... Um, I like the black and white too. I'll get both your comments. So yeah. it's a book I'm working on right now, newer work. How were you in Southpaw Club in Brooklyn, 2005? <laughs> wow, you were just like ahead of the game everywhere. Yeah. I hadn't thought of that. Um, I don't know how. I know how actually. Uh, there's a woman that can't remember her name. Anyway. <laughs> She was working for, um, for a gallery, and I knew her through that. And um, she was a woman, she's now a gallerist. She has a gallery on the Upper East Side. But in those days, um, you know, she just knew a lot of the performers. And she said, you know, if you're interested in this, it's going to be, a, it was a festival, one of the early festivals. And she said, there's one of the South Park Club. And those were before GPS, you know, how did I find 4th Street or 5th Street, whatever it was, um, in Brooklyn? I mean, I barely knew what Brooklyn was after the Dodger But But um, so I find my way somehow to the South Club Club. And it was fun. That was kind of a hip club. It would be gone by now, right? Is that on there? I, yeah, I, I actually don't know. Yeah. Didn't know either. Well, uh, yeah. Cool. Giselle lived in Brooklyn for a long time. In fact, you were an early pioneer, as I recall, in Williamsburg. Fairly early, right? Early-ish. Early. -ish. early. <laughs> but it was oh, it was like post Wild Dog. So, uh. so like I know a few people that were like pre Wild Dog era and in Williamsburg. <laughs> Change. Um, All right, uh, so we're nearing yeah. five o'clock here. Did you want to do the book giveaway? Oh yeah, let's do that here. Yeah, let's do Yay, it. Yay, book giveaway, here we are. <laughs> and if you made it this far, let's see. Okay, so let's stop. Oh, you're right, I'll just go here. I will have to stop sharing to start. All right, so while Giselle is setting that up, uh, to everyone watching, the auction uh, for these three Genesis pieces in the show series is going live in about three minutes. So it will start at uh, 5 p.m. EST, and that's when you can get your bids in. <laughs> <laughs> All right, just joking. Did it work? Okay. Oh, yeah, almost. <laughs> 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 Wait a minute. So let's see. How do we do uh, this? Share. Oh, I need a share button. Oh, here it is again. Okay. Here cool. we go. Try, try one more time. Yeah. We love technology. <laughs> let's see. Yay. Tech. Okay. Wheel of names. Oh, does it work? Do you see yes. it? Yes. All right. All right. These are the 28 entries. Um, Claudia, I know you retweeted. I don't know if it's, are you supposed to be in here too? Don't add me in. No, 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 no. If no, I win okay. this, I'll feel so bad. <laughs> okay. Oh, no. Okay. So I'll take you out right before. I thought mm -hmm. to ask just in case. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah. Here we are. 27 entries. Now we go. And one, two, three, go. I feel like I need like a drum roll. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh. <laughs> Empire. Okay. Empire. Nice. Congrats. Do you know Empire? No, I don't. Do we know Empire? Oh, Congratulations. Congratulations. I hope I can contact you for it, send you an awesome book. You know, uh, I might ask in case Empire's with us, but also when you 
uh, contact him or they. Um, if um, if an, I would usually sign the book with my name, but I'll do it a personalization. If, if oh, were, awesome! I'm sure I will. It, I will let them know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That'd be great. Very cool. Cool. All right, and then this is done. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, I think that's the end of the talk. I, I wanted to say thank you again, Giselle and Henry, so much for coming out. And that's the book. Oh, it looks so good. Yay. <laughs> wow. This, uh, there are two versions of this book, but this is Oops. the yeah. special edition, which mm -hmm. covers that's gold. And only, uh, I think 300, two or 300 were printed of that. The paperback is the same book, but it's paperback. Oh, it's an edition of two or three hundred. You said it's an edition of two or three hundred. Awesome. Oh wow, cool. That's my friend Jess. Just... That was your friend, right? Yeah. 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 <laughs> the kids are like teenage monsters now. Mm -hmm. Oh wow! They're beautiful children. Right? I want to see a new portrait of her now. <laughs> <laughs> With her children. She looks good, but uh, yeah, she's semi-retired from uh, the rest. But I think she'll be back. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, yeah, Claudia, thank you so much. This was really fun. Of course, thank you. I'm so excited to see uh, to see the auction go through, and yeah, it's been fantastic. Auction is now live. It is. It's I'm live. Good. Let's share it. <laughs> <laughs> Great. All right. Well, and thank you everyone for tuning in. Uh, there's lots of comments coming in. Uh, thank you. I'm so jealous. <laughs> Perfect. Okay. So, yep, that's it. So, we'll see you on on Twitter. We'll share this around and Perfect. Perfect. Sure to follow follow off on gallery and yes. Ephemera and Henry. Henry. Yes. <laughs> and all her artists. So, I don't I'm curious as to who's going to pop up after uh, after me. So, uh, I'm following. <laughs> all right. Thank you all. All right. Thank you. See ya. Bye -bye.